Uh, hello everyone, once again. My name is Marcin Boris. I'm a project manager uh, here at Polish Research Center uh, for the law and economy of China. Uh, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you to the next Polish Asian gathering. Uh, yet another held online uh, in this third wave of COVID-19 uh, in Poland. I'm very happy that you, so many of you decided to spend this evening here with us together. Um, the event is organized by the University of Warsaw as a part of the Bridge to Asia project founded by the National Agency for Academic Exchange. Uh, the Polish Asian Gatherings is a series of meetings for representatives of academia, business and governmental institutions. The meetings are designed to foster knowledge about Asia, build a network of experts who deal with Asian affairs on a daily basis, as well as encourage the transfer of knowledge from academia to business and business to academia. Uh, the meeting will consist of two parts. First, a keynote speech by Michał Nita, and then we are going to move on to an open discussion between the keynote speaker, Michał, and all the participants. During the second part, we can encourage you to use your cameras and microphones, and of course, you can also use the uh, chat uh, feature and type in your questions and remarks. Um, we hope we can have some fruitful discussions after the keynote, just like we did when we were meeting in person at the University of Warsaw at the Faculty of Law. Uh, now I would like to shortly introduce our today's speaker, uh, Michał Nita, who is a Sinology and Law graduate from the University of Warsaw. He's also a Confucius Institute Fellow at Peking University in the years 2016-17, winner of the first prize of the Minister of Education and Science and second prize of the Polish-Chinese Business Council for the thesis on the protection systems of well-known trademarks in the PRC and Poland. Uh, Michał Nita is also a lawyer in the IP and TMT department of Domański Zakrzewski Palinka Law Firm. He is a trainee attorney at law at the Warsaw Bar Association, and he is a co-translator from Chinese into Polish of a book titled China and Central and Eastern Europe: History of Liter Literary Contacts. And um, once again, we are honored that you have accepted our invitation today and we can host you here, Michal. And Michal's keynote speech, as you know, will concern the issue of the protection of trademark, uh, trademarks in China, especially the well-known trademarks. Uh, Michal, the floor is yours. And actually, we cannot see your presentation right now. Um. Yeah, I think oh, yeah, you, can, you can see it right now. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, good evening, all. Thank you very much for logging uh, to our today's event. And thank you uh, very much, Boris. And um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, and I would like to thank the school for inviting me to, to give a lecture uh, today evening. So, um, as Boris said, um we will talk about we will talk about a protect um, the protection of well-known trademarks in china uh, during today's meeting um the well-known trademarks um, are getting more and more important um, in the business activity of of companies around the world um, since um, brand is um, a key asset of of companies today um, therefore, um, as a vital part of um, IP portfolio, um, it is a very uh, important thing to, to protect um, well-known trademarks in every jurisdiction, um, especially in such a big market as China. Um, before we uh, delve into the system of protection of uh, uh, well-known trademarks, we first need to um, establish a proper terminology. Um, what we are talking about uh, when we refer to well-known trademarks. The terminology is a little bit tricky in, in that aspect. Um, first of all, um, I would like to introduce you to the terms used in the Chinese language and uh, Chinese legal sphere. sphere. Um, so the most important term um, in the continental China, as well as special, administ special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau, um, is uh, Ming Shangbiao, uh, which can be translated to, to well-known trademark in English. 
Um, besides that, um, there used to be also um, institu institutions called Juming Shangbiao and Jiming Shangbiao. However, these were not um, legal, uh, completely legal concept. Uh, they were rather um, only regional systems of, um, of protection um, for, for particular trademarks. They were established either on the provincial uh, level or on the city, city, uh, city's level. Um, having said that, in 2019, uh, Chinese, um, the, the China National Intellectual Property um, Administration uh, decided to get rid of um, those regional systems of protection. Therefore, um, the terms uh, Juming Shangbiao and Jiming Shangbiao are no longer valid um, in the continental China. Um, on the side note, uh, I, I would like to I would like to say that uh, the term Juming Shangbiao um, is being used in the um, Republic of China on Taiwan in the legal um, legal acts um, of the um, issued by the um, government of Taiwan. So, um, if you refer to a well-known trademark in Taiwan, um, you should call it Juming Shangbiao. Um, now, uh, going to the English language, um, in, especially in the European law, um, in the European uh, directives um, and regulations, uh, we have two different terms, that is trademark with reputation and a well-known trademark. So, the, um, both of those trademarks um, are the, um, you, can, you can also call them trademarks that are very well known, that are known by um, a significant portion of, of people. Um, however, the main difference between those two terms is that trademark with reputation uh, refers to a registered trademark. Um, that is a trademark registered either in the um, EU intellectual property office in Alicante, um, which uh, registers the um, European trademarks, or in the national um, patent office, such as the um, Polish patent office, um, uh, the Urząd Patentowy Rzeczpospolitej Polski. Um, in the Polish language, um, as, as some of the listeners here are Polish, um, uh, I would also like to, to talk briefly about that. Um, in Polish language, we have renomowany znak towarowy, um, and um, powszechnie znany znak towarowy. So the renomowany znak towarowy would be a trademark with reputation. That is a registered trademark um, that is well known by uh, by a relevant public. Um, and uh, powszechnie znany znak towarowy would be a well known trademark that is unregistered um, trademark well known by uh, by the general public. Um, so now, uh, since we know what we are going to talk about, that is mainly Qiming Shangbiao in China, um, let me let me jump to the um, to the legal sources that uh, we should be concerned with today. So the main the main legal act um, that um, that concerns us is the trademark law of the People's Republic of China. That is Zhonghua Renmin Gunghua Guo Shangbiao Fa. This legal act was adopted um, in, the, in uh, 1982 um, and it was amended four times. Uh, last time actually was just two years ago in 2019. Um, the trademark law um, of the PRC um, established a first to file system which is uh, the same kind of system that we have in the European Union and different one that, for example, the United States have. So the first to file system, um, its, main, its main characteristic is that um, the um, exclusive right to use a trademark um, shall be granted to, to a person who 
filed um, an application for registration first. So um, it doesn't matter that um, some, some other um, entity um, would use the trademark before before the registrant. Um, what matters is the is the filing of, of the application. Um, of course, there are some exceptions to to that rule, but that is the rule nonetheless. Um, when it comes to well-known trademarks, the um, relevant provisions were added uh, during the um, second amendment uh, of the. A PRC trademark law in 2001, and then developed in 2013. The amendment from 2013 um, was especially uh, was especially important because during that time, um, the definition, the legal definition of a well-known trademark, um, was added to the to the trademark law which is um, quite extraordinary comparing to the European or the American um, law system. Apart from the um, proper legal sources, that is statutory law, um, in, in, in the Chinese legal system, um, there are also other kinds of documents which are very important for the legal practice. Um, in case of the well-known trademarks, um, we should um, we should be concerned with with two of uh, such documents. The first one would be um, the Supreme Spe Supreme People's Court interpretation, um, that is the the highest court in the PRC. Um, so, as we can see here, um, in two thousand nineteen, the uh, SPC adopted adopted um, interpretation of the SPC on several issues concerning the application of law to the trial of cases of civil disputes over the protection of famous trademarks. So actually this document is is really important as in some in some instances it tends to uh, divert from the uh, wording, uh, in the statutory law, that is in the trademark law. Um, I will get uh, into that uh, later. The other uh, important uh, document that uh, we should study um, um, in terms of in terms of protection of well-known trademark would be um, state administration for industry and commerce provisions. Um, those those provisions were adopted in two thousand and three and then amended in 2014. That is one year after the amendment of the trademark law in 2013. Um, therefore, the, the provisions were, um, the, the wording in the provisions was changed according to the amendments made to the trademark law. And that is also why the administrative provisions, um, which we have here, um, are more compatible with the current uh, wording of the trademark law than the um, SPC's um, judicial interpretations, which were um, um, adopted before the amendment of 2013. Um, so um, what's the difference um, between, between those documents? On, on which matters do they differ? So the first one, the, the, the first such case um, would be a legal definition, uh, a, a definition of a well-known trademark. Um, as I mentioned before, in 2013, a legal definition, that is a definition stipulated in statutory law, in the trademark law, um, was, was added. And as we can see here, um, according to the Article 13, Paragraph 1 of the trademark law, um, a holder of a trademark that is well known by the relevant public may, if he holds that uh, his right have been infringed upon, request for well-known trademark protection in accordance with this law. So, um, as we can see here, um, we can we can interpret from this from this um, provision that a well-known trademark would be a trademark that is well known uh, in Chinese shuji by the relevant public, um, that is Shangguan Gongzhong. 
and that is that is the whole definition um it is quite important that it was added to the trademark law um in such way because um it it's it's um it stopped um legal discussions on the on the fact uh, on uh, on the um, issue connected with the uh, of whether a well-known trademark should be uh, should have a, a good image. That is, um, it should be associated with uh, good qualities of uh, products or services. Um, that is also a problem in in the European law that um, some judges would still would still think that a well-known trademark should be also considered should be also associated with those. Uh, with this good quality of products and services. Uh, however, now the the um, the most the dominating uh, judicial opinion is that um, it is all it should be only well known by the relevant public, and the uh, um, qualitative um, aspects should not be considered um, for the well known trademarks. Um, jumping now to the interpretations, um, as we can see here, uh, the definition is slightly different. So um, the term well-known trademark, as mentioned in this interpretations, uh, refers to a trademark widely known in Chinese here, Jixiao, by the corresponding general public within China, that is Tsai Zhongguo Jingnei. Um, and then in the administrative provisions, we can see that the term well-known trademark means a trademark well-known. And here we have the, ter the verb shuji, the same one as in the trademark law, by the relevant public in China, Tsai Zhongguo. So um, as we can see, apart from the uh, different use of verbs, which is not that very important actually, and, uh, and legal scholars, um, uh, tend to say that that um, those those verbs here are actually synonyms, and um, they should not that that this um, this difference should not uh, impact um, the recognition of of the well known trademarks by either courts or administrative bodies. Uh, but the addition of Tsai uh, Zhongguo Jingnei or Tsai Zhongguo uh, can be quite in, can be deemed quite important because um, according to the definition uh, of the trademark law, uh, it would not matter if uh, if the trademark is well known, for example, only in the European Union or in the United States, um, and then um, if somebody um, infringed upon uh, infringed our trademark rights for this trademark well known in the United States that we could seek um, protection in China only based on the fact that the trademark is well known in some other country. But um, since interpretations and provisions which are used in practice um, specify that it should be uh, well known in China then we need to focus while gathering our evidence. Uh, we should focus on um, on on evidence that um, the trademark is well known by Chinese citizens. And on the side note, of course, there are also different definitions of what Zhongguo actually is. Yes, um, is it only continental China? Uh, is it also is it continental China plus two special administrative regions or Maybe it's also uh, the Republic of China in Taiwan. Um, and actually, there are some cases um, where a fact that the, a trademark is well, was well known only in Taiwan would also be considered um, by a judge um, to, 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 to be the evidence for, for the fact that the trademark is well known in China. So that is also quite a pickle to resolve. Um, so the one of the most important term in the definition is the relevant public, uh, because um, uh, when we hear well-known trademark, um, we could assume that 
that the trademark should be known by almost everybody or um, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent um, of the members of society. Uh, however, it is not that that simple because different services and different goods um, have different set of um, of recipients. So, for example, some goods would be only, re for example, luxury goods uh, would be only um, known within a small number number of people that uh, can afford them. Um, so that is why the term relevant public is used here. So it can be uh, so so that it is flexible and it can be adjusted to to a um, particular type of uh, goods or services. Uh, as we can see here, relevant public um, includes uh, consumers related to certain kind of commodities, that is goods or services indicated by a trademark, manufacturers of the aforesaid uh, goods or other operators providing relevant services and the sellers and uh, relevant people involved in marketing channels. So we can see three different groups here, uh, mainly speaking. Uh, consumers of services and goods, uh, manufacturers or providers um, of either goods or services, and uh, sellers and other people involved uh, or companies involved in marketing channels. So when we uh, seek protection for our well-known trademark, um, we should uh, gather evidence for for um this for the fact that the trademark is um, well known in all of those in all of those groups um that would be the uh, the perfect the perfect solution of course to to be granted uh, protection so um we should not only focus for example um on the uh, opinion polls about our goods or services that that um, everybody knows our product but uh, we should also, um, for example, um, provide provide the judge or administrative body um, with some rankings um, um, rankings made by by newspapers uh, or, um, for example, business associations. Um, Article 14, paragraph one of the trademark law um, states a case-by-case -case approach in terms of um, well-known trademark. So that means that when we seek protection for a well-known trademark, um, it can be granted to us only for this particular case. Um, therefore, if in the future um, we would like to, um, to seek protection for a trademark once again, um, then we'll have to go through the process one more time. Um, the, this provision is associated with the fact that in the past, um, in, in China, actually the status of well-known trademark um, was, was sometimes granted for um, a particular number of years. So, for example, if a judge um, decided that, uh, that our trademark is well-known, uh, we would be granted a formal certificate for five or 10 years. And then we could only go to the court with the certificate, uh, show it to the judge, and uh, we would be granted um, a protection from the uh, infringer. Um, since this is not, this is not um, how well-known trademarks uh, work in other legal systems, um, also, uh, the Chinese legal system was amended in that manner. Um, and now the well-known trademark protection uh, can be only granted uh, upon request uh, by the party concerned, um, as we can see here, and only in the specific um, trademark-related case. Okay, so that was the um, basic introduction. And now um, let us go into the practice, um, how, um, how a judge or administrative body um, will decide whether our trademark is well known. 
So um, there are a few different factors that um, either, either court or, or, or administrative body um, will take into account. The first and most important one that is going to be taken into consideration always in every case um, is the first one, that is the recognition degree of the trademark among the relevant public. Um, so um, other, other factors are just uh, peripheral um, and can only help to, um, to prove the fact that the trademark is well known. But the, the, first, the first factor um, is the decisive one. Uh, so in order to prove before the court or administrative body that um, our trademark is um, recognized uh, by among the re relevant public, um, as I mentioned before, we should provide um, as much evidence as we can. <laughs> so um, for example, that could be um, opinion polls about um, the, about just proving a recognition of of uh, goods and services um, that are marked with our trademark. Um, that can be also um, rankings in which uh, in which our goods and products, uh, our goods and services, um, are mentioned as one of the best. Um, that could be also um, um, also some um, listings made by the uh, business associations. Um, the second factor uh, that it, um, should be taken into account by the by the judge um, or the administrative body um, would be the duration um, in which the trademark has been in use. Um, so, um, here we can we can see that uh, the trademark law refers to use of of the trademark, and use of the trademark uh, refers to the um, use of the trademark on goods or um, packaging of, of of the goods containers, um, as well as uh, transaction documents um, with our um, business partners. Um, it can also refer to using our trademark for advertising, um, exhibition on some expos, um, and other commercial activities um, where we identify the source of our goods or services. Um, the third factor would be the duration, extent, and geographical scope of all publicity operations carried out for our trademark. Um, in this case, um, the wider the wider the scope is, of course, uh, the better for uh, it, the better for us to um, to be to be granted uh, the status of of the well known trademark. Um, for example, um, we should we should prove to the judge that um, that we um promote our services and goods amongst the chinese consumers uh, for example by um providing uh, advertisements um, strictly strictly uh, targeted on the chinese consumer uh, for example using um chinese uh, subtitle chinese subtitles in the uh, in our advertisements or um adjusting the whole the the whole um concept of the um advertisement to the chinese market so in this case we can we can cite um we can cite uh, a court case um of bloomberg um versus uh, shanghai pongbo of 2007 when um the shanghai district people's court found that although bloomberg um was transmitting its channel in the PRC, um, it did not broadcast any programs in Chinese. And for that reason, um, the Shanghai District People's Court um, decided that um, the trademark Bloomberg um, had not achieved a reputation in the PRC market and the trademark was not granted a protection. Uh, that is also um, 
that is also the case that I um, of of the fact that the um, courts would recognize only um, fame of the trademark in, within the Chinese uh, within the Chinese borders. So the fact that Bloomberg is very well known, uh, the channel Bloomberg is very well known in the U.S. or in the or, or in Europe. Um, it does not. It does not concern that much um, the Chinese uh, courts. Um, however, having said that, um, the records of protection of a well-known trademark uh, provided for the trademark um, are also deemed important. Um, so, of course, the most important. Um, evidences of recognition would be uh, recognition by the Chinese courts or Chinese administrative bodies. But uh, uh, um, in case of this factor, we can also provide um, court, uh, court decisions um, that were made abroad and um, that stated that our trademark is well known. Um, the, uh, Last one, the last, the last point here um, shows us that the catalog of the factors um, is actually um, open, and judges or administrative bodies can can take uh, into consideration um, different factors that that are not listed in the points from one to four. Um, here in the presentation, I listed some of the um, some of those. Um, um, factors that can be taken into account. That is materials on the sales revenue, market share, net profits, tax amount, and sales territory of the principal uh, commodities using this trademark in the recent uh, three years. So uh, to sum up this, this slide, um, every, every evidence counts. Um, of course, the most important ones are uh, the ones that prove that uh, our trademark is um, um, very well known among a relevant public. Um, so things like opinion polls or some rankings. Um, but we should also remember about, about those other factors um, while gathering evidence. Um, so. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, the title of this slide should be slightly different. Um, um, it should be here that instances where the trademark can be recognized as well known. So as we can see, um, we can recognize trademarks as well known in uh, three different instances. Uh, first of all, during trademark registration review. So uh, this is a process when we already filed an application for a trademark to the um, to the patent office um, or in the case of China, uh, the um, trademark office of the China National Intellectual Property Administration. Um, and after after filing our application, the office um, will review our registration and in case of some defects um, um, either office or the third party which for example thinks that our trademark um, will infringe on their exclusive right to their trademark um, the, those those uh, parties can file for example an opposition uh, to our trademark and um, just express express um, refutal to the um, to the application. Uh, besides that, um, the well the status of of trademark as well known can be also seek during administrative cases. Um, handled by the trademark office of the China National Intellectual Property Administration and the um, and the upper upper body uh, from the um, from the trademark office um, that is appeal appeal body um, 
and the second and the third and the last one um instance would be the judicial civil and administrative cases involving trademarks um so as well as in in the in poland for example um also in in china um courts uh, handle both uh, civil and administrative cases related to the trademarks so of course in in the administrative cases um they uh, they um judge the um, decisions issued by the administrative bodies and in civil cases uh, the whole process starts and ends within the court um, so now um how are the um, well-known trademarks uh, protected um in which kind of uh, situation um what um, um what uh, circumstances uh, has to be uh, have to be fulfilled um to to seek the protection so as we can see in the article 13 paragraph 2 of the trademark law um, where the trademark of an identical, that is Shangtung, or similar Lei Si kind of goods or services is a reproduction, um, Fu Zhi, imitation, Mo uh, Fang, or translation, Fan Yi, of another person's well known trademark not registered in China and is liable to cause public confusion, that is Rong Yi Dao Zhi Huan Xi, no application for its registration may be granted. And its use shall be prohibited. Prohibited. Um, so actually, this paragraph refers to, as we can see, unregistered trademarks. So if we um, if we um, jump to the European uh, legal system, that would be the well-known trademarks. Uh, that would be tr well-known trademarks in the European systems. But in the Chinese system, there is no distinction between a well-known trademark and trademark with reputation. Um, so we can we can only uh, differentiate between unregistered well-known trademark and registered um, well-known trademark. Um, in this case, we have a classic situation of confusion um, between um, two trademarks and uh, goods or services that are uh, marked by by those trademarks. Um, so confusion is the situation where where um, consumers um, or manufacturers um, or other um, other people uh, that approach two trademarks, um, the situation where they cannot actually recognize what is the difference between those trademarks. Um, um, and that is a situation where um where for example they can uh for example take one type of goods a good um marked by one trademark uh but they thought that um they were going to take um another type of goods marked by different trademark um so of course if the trademarks are identical uh that is quite an easy easy situation to imagine yes that somebody just just uh, wants to register uh, want to register or use the same kind the same kind of um, of uh, trademark as we have however when it comes to similarity uh, there it is it is a little bit different uh, because there are just uh, different levels of similarity of course uh as we can see here and this is actually um uh quite um quite original situation in china in chinese legal system um we have three different situation um where there is a similarity um it is either reproduction imitation or translation um, especially the third one, considering the differences between the um, Latin uh, languages using Latin script and Chinese language using uh, characters, um, is um, important. And uh, we will talk about this later. Um, so, as we can see here, um, in in cases of unregistered trademarks, um, 
we need um, to have to 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 public to be confused about two trademarks in order to see protection. So they cannot make head or, head or tails when they see uh, our trademark and uh, uh, other parties' trademark. Um, the situation is a little bit trickier in case of the trademark that is registered in China and it is well known. Um, so in case of the European legal system, uh, that would be a trademark with reputation. Um, and in this case, um, it is also, it is also um, when there is a reproduction, imitation or translation, but here it refers to a different or dissimilar kind of goods. So, uh, Bu Xiang Tong or uh, Bu Xiang Lei Si. Uh, actually, uh, I have to be honest with you that I do not quite uh, know the difference between something to be different and dissimilar. And uh, Chinese legal scholars also have problem with that. Uh, I think that uh, it's here it's just a little bit uh, slip of the um, of the Chinese legislator uh, who just uh, decided to um, to use negation of those two terms to um, reflect the wording of paragraph three uh, to the paragraph two of the article thirteen. Um, and as we can see here, in case of the uh, trademarks reputation, that is trademark registers in China that are well known, um, we can see protection. We can seek protection when the latter um, trademark, um, in in relation to our trademark, our well known trademark, misleads the public, so that the interests of the owner of the registered well known trademark, that is us, are likely to be impaired. Uh, so, in Chinese, that is Wu Dao Gong Zhong Zhi Shi Gai Qi Ming Shang Biao Zhu Ci Ren the Li Yi Ke Neng Shou Dao Xuan Hai. So, actually, um, according to the Chinese legal scholars, um, though the wording in the paragraph three and the wording in paragraph two uh, is quite similar. Um, and um, it is still not. It is still not. Um, th there is still no consensus um, on whether uh, there is actually a wider protection um, for trademarks that are registered and the trademark that are not registered. Um, however, if uh, those two those two uh, wordings, that is the one here and the one here would mean the same thing uh, that would not that would not be sensible uh, from the from the um, legislators uh, point of view and uh, that is why as we can, as we will uh, see later um, the supreme people's court actually expanded on on this on this expression here uh, and um, invented the um, dilution, dilution um, theory in in China in the Chinese legal system, which grants well-known trademark uh, much more wider, much more wider protection. Um, okay, so now let us uh, proceed to some uh, cases. Um, here we can see the first um, instance of imitation of just a case, um, case where um, judge considered whether two trademarks are actually uh, an, one, one trademark is imitation of another one. Um, so in this case, that is Nike Innovative, Innovate uh, versus State Administration for Industry and Commerce. Uh, that is right now uh, China National Industry Industrial Property Administration. Uh, in this case, the judge um, um, was considering whether those two trademarks um, are similar uh, in the way that this one is an imitation of this one. Um, so, first of all, <laughs> I, I won't say that the that judge decided that they are not uh, similar. 
as this one is not imitation of a Nike trademark. Uh, and the reasons that uh, judge stated in this case um, was that, uh, first of all, um, the Nike mark, the Nike trademark um, did not contain any letters and uh, by 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 Yen Wang um, trademark um, had some letters um, here uh, in the uh, lower side of the trademark. Um, the other other argument that was used by the court uh, to deny similarity was that um, there was that the hook of the trademark um, is uh, quite quite different. The, the hooks of both of those trademarks are quite different. So as we can see here, the, this hook starts here and it goes like that. <laughs> and here the the shape of it is uh, quite quite different. Uh, the third the third reason for for the judge to uh, deny imitation in this case um, was that the um, the by by Yen Wang, um, where we can see that in the name of this trademark we have the character for Yen um, that is a swallow, um, a kind of bird. Um, that the trademark here represents actually um, a swallow, um, this kind of bird, um, and. In case of Nike, there is no resemblance to to an animal or especially to to a bird. So, um, in this case, the Bayon Wang uh, trademark was innovative uh, in that in that sense. Um, the last but last but not least, um, the Nike the Nike trademark has a filling. Uh, it's it's filled here. And uh, in Bayan Wang um, trademark, um, there are empty spaces. Um, based on those arguments, uh, the um, Supreme People's Court uh, decided that there is no imitation uh, here, that there was no imitation there. Now, the other case, um, now here I can say at the beginning that the um the spc decided that those two trademarks were actually uh similar and this um trademark sakura uh, inhua uh, was an imitation of the wonder flower uh, trademark and uh, as we can see um in both of those cases uh you can argue that uh, those trademark uh, are not very similar but you can also argue that there are, and this is uh, what I would like to stress: that that um, that it depends very much on the on the judge that is uh, adjudicating our case. So um, in this case, um, that is Nanchang Shi in Huashi um, versus China National Intellectual Property Administration from 2019, um, judge uh, decided that um that both of those um sign um had verbal had verbal layer um and although there were chinese characters in the sakura um in the sakura trademark um the fact that they both have have uh, those uh, verbal those verbal um layers um it's proofs it it was one of the proof uh, for their uh, similarity um, um what is more um the number um uh, and however the oh, sorry um um in both of those in both of those um trademarks uh there is some kind of um flower cherry flower um that is uh, a little bit different uh, that is depicted a little bit differently uh, however the main the main element of the of those two trademark is the same that is the the cherry cherry flower um so um as we can see from the uh from both of those cases um 
the sometimes the interpretations of the of the courts um, in well-known trademark cases um, are a bit, bit are, are a little bit tricky, and um, it um, it depends on on our argumentation um, whether we will be able to convince the judge that uh, some other um, owners um, imitated our trademark. Um, now let me talk about the other instance of of similarity between trademarks in the Chinese um, in the Chinese um, legal system. Uh, that is translation. Um, here we have um, uh, already quite a classic case of Pfizer versus State Administration for Industry and Commerce from two thousand nine. That is the Via Viagra case. Um, and this case actually um, has stressed out um, how important is that to come up with a good Chinese name for your product um, while entering the Chinese market. Uh, so in this, in this case, Pfizer, um, an American uh, pharmaceutical company, um, wanted to introduce its, uh, one of the, its most um, well-known products, that is Viagra. Um, and they came up with a Chinese name that is not that much appealing, I guess, <laughs> to uh, Chinese consumers. Uh, one I call um, that is actually the transliteration of the of um, Viagra into Chinese, and um, um, it just does not sound that appealing. So um, there were other companies, companies based in China that started to come up with their own products just before uh, Pfizer uh, um, decided to enter into uh, the Chinese market. And um, the Chinese company um, started to, to uh, produce a good, a, a pharmaceutical uh, named Weigo, which was also in the shape of the uh, famous blue pill and actually the name Weigo um was uh had some had, had some good connotations with with chinese public uh it means uh something like strong men mighty mighty men and um when the when this case uh, reached a uh, chinese court um the um all of the courts uh, even the supreme people's court uh, decided that um, we didn't have a, an instance of translation in in this case um, because uh, Pfizer, when they when they entered the Chinese market, they decided to use the term one I call, and they did not want to to use the term Wei Ge. That was uh, they didn't consider using that, uh, and only after the ter the pharmaceutical named Wega appeared on the market, uh, they decided to, to sue the infringer for that. Um, um, so um, according to the court, the American company, that is Pfizer, had, known, had not shown a translation relationship between the names Viagra and um, Wega. Um, and as I said before, um, this case showed that foreign entities uh, has have to carefully choose um, choose Chinese names for their products and services. Uh, the other famous case is the case of Michael Jordan and uh, his brand Air Jordan, um, which was um, which was kind of taken over in uh, on the Chinese market by a company called Chaodan Sports, Chaodan Tu. Uh, as we can see here, uh, there was not only problem with translation, but also of imitation of the famous uh, of the famous graphic of uh, dunking Michael Jordan. However, uh, here we would like to uh, I would like to talk about the the translation about the um, the verbal verbal um, element of the trademarks. Um, so. Um, we we should we should remember that um, when we register trademarks in China, uh, especially foreign trademarks, 
we not only have to register them in Chinese characters, but also register them in Pinyin, um, because um, in some case, in some cases, um, especially when we then talk about our products, uh, about our products on the Chinese market uh, to people outside of China, um, we would use Latin script and um, and mm, write the name of our product in Pinyin, not in the Chinese characters. Um, and if we do not register the Pinyin variant of our of our trademark, it could be uh, taken over by by some other companies. And in this case, um, um, I, I would like to cut it short. Uh, the the Supreme People's Court actually ruled that the uh, Chao Dan written in the in the Chinese characters was uh, similar to the um, Jordan trademark, um, and we had a case of translation here. However, um, in terms of uh, Chao Dan, in terms of uh, just in terms of uh, Pinyin um, um, notation um, of of this trademark. Um, there was no case of translation because uh, Chao Dan, uh, written in Pinyin, uh, only according to the judge, uh, could mean uh, different things, not only the name Jordan. Um, however, uh, in my opinion, in this case, uh, there are not. I, I, I'm not sure whether there are other words that are pronounced Chao Dan in in Chinese language. Um, okay, so apart from the similarity of uh, trademarks, we should also remember about the similarity of goods and services, um, which is especially important for the unregistered um, well-known trademarks. Um, as, and as we can see here, similar goods uh, refer to goods that are uh, the same in terms of function, purpose, production, department, sales channel, consumer objects, etc or that the relevant public generally believes that they have a specific connection and are likely to cause confusion. Um, so, of course, um, uh, it can be sometimes tricky to, to know um, which goods or services can be considered similar, similar by Chinese judge or administrative body. And in this case, what is, uh, what is vital um, is a document called Classification of Similar Goods and Services, that is Leise Shangpin He Fu Wu Chu Fen Biao, which provides um, which provides some um, some help um, to uh, in determination of uh, which goods or services are similar. And although this document is issued by the state. Intellectual Property Office, but by the um, China National Industrial Property Office, uh, it is not a binding document, and it should be only used for for reference, uh, not as a legal act. Um, as I said before, um, there there was there was a problem of interpretation. Uh, of paragraph two of article 13 and paragraph three of article 13, especially um, those phrases that um, talked about either um, causing public confusion or uh, misleading the public so that the interests of the owner of the registered world trademark are likely to be impaired. So in case of the registered well-known trademarks, um, the Supreme People's Court decided in its interpretation that the, that the protection of such registered well-known trademarks should be wider. And that is why in the Article 9, Paragraph 2 uh, of their interpretation, um, they came up with, with a, a dilution, with a dilution uh, theory. Um, that is, they stated three different instances where the registered well-known trademark uh, can be infringed um, by, by other trademark, even when the goods or services that are marked by the trademark are not similar. Um, and those three cases um, are blurring, um, that is 
um, when the distinctiveness of the famous trademark is diluted. Uh, this is, for example, a case where, um, for example, trademark um, for um, Johnson & Johnson product, that is Pampers, um, was used for uh, mo mostly for the diapers, yes. And um, there, there were just um, that, uh, there was just this uh, very quick uh, association made by consumers that diapers are pumpers. Um, and um, if other if other holder of a trademark would use um, its its trademark to mark um, uh, to mark uh, and this trade and this later trademark would be a imitation or tra translation um, then um, it would impact uh, the distinctiveness of the pumpers trademark and um, it would be considered um, that not only that not all of the diapers are pumpers <laughs> um, and um, so that is blaring of a trademark. Um, the second uh, situation is tarnishment. That is when the market reputation of the famous trademark, of well-known trademark is um, degraded. And this is uh, a little bit simpler situation. So for example, if the later trademark um, would be an imitation or translation of, uh, for example, Louis Vuitton trademark, which is usually used for luxury goods. And then this later uh, trademark, which is an imitation or translation of a well-known trademark, would be used for some um, low quality products or I don't know, uh, toilet products, yes, which are not associated that much with wealth um and um high high level of high quality of life um and the third and last um situation um, um that was um brought by by the supreme people's court is free riding uh that is the situation when the market reputation of the famous trademark is improperly utilized um that is when the holder of the later trademark um, would um, make would, would uh, develop its trademark in a way that associates um, his trademark with the well-known trademark um, in a uh, improper way. So only to <clears throat> to um, imitate that the that his trademark or her trademark um is some kind of, is in a way associated to the the, the well-known trademark for example that they are sister companies and they offer the same quality of products uh, or or services so uh, to end my uh my lecture because yes we're running up to an hour um we, uh, I have um, a quite interesting facts um, at, at the end. Um, that is um, the Chinese trademark law actually forbids uh, companies from using the term well-known trademark, Ximing Shangbiao, on its products. Uh, as we can see here uh, in this provision, no manufacturers and business operators may indicate the word uh, well-known trademark upon their goods, packaging, or the containers of the goods, as well as services. Nor may they use the same for advertising, exhibition, or other commercial activities. And such action, um, the violation of this, of this um, ban, um, would result in the fine of uh, 100,000 uh, renminbi, uh, which cannot be decreased to a smaller amount <laughs> uh, and it's quite strict. Um, on uh, last but not least, um, when we are holders of, uh, of a well-known trademark, um, then according to the article 45 of the well-known trademark, um, 
we can um, try to invalidate um, other registered trademarks um, that are um, that are infringing upon our rights. Um, and in case of well-known trademark, there is no time limit. So in case of regular trademark, we can only do that within uh, five years. However, in case of well-known trademark, um, there is no time limit. However, the um, registration for the later trademark has to be obtained mala fide, that is with an evil, evil intention, um, which, which is um, kind of an answer of Chinese legislator to the practices of Chinese companies where they would register well-known trademarks of companies around the world before they entered the uh, Chinese market. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your attention and you can contact me uh, using both of those uh, email addresses. Um, and uh, once again, thank you and I'm waiting for a question if you have any. Thank you, Michal, once again for your keynote. Uh, I think we have all learned a lot. And uh, as I asked you in the beginning, you can all submit your questions on the chat, which is open uh, for questions. Um, I'd like to start, kick off the, the discussion um, by asking you, what shall be the, perhaps you, you, could, you could tell us shortly about it, the step-by-step -step procedure uh, in case, for example, a Polish entity who has a registered trademark in China discovers that um, it's that there is a Chinese entity that infringes the its uh, IP rights to this trademark. Uh, could you tell us perhaps what such an entity could do, and what would be the steps to? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I think the most important thing to, to underline here, and uh, it's not underlined very often uh, during such kind of lectures, is that it depends on whether we have an international trademark registered by the World Intellectual Property Organization or a trademark registered by Chinese um, trademark office. So um, in, in case we have international trademark, registered by WIPO, that is the World Intellectual Property Office, we actually cannot do anything. <laughs> and this is this is coming from my practice when, for example, um, we try to brought we, we tried to bring um, a case against infringer on the Alibaba platform um, using the Alibaba um, IP platform for reporting infringement uh, infringement. And, the, and Alibaba would not consider us having um, a proper uh, registered trademark in China. So we, first of all, we always have to register our trademarks within uh, the Chinese uh, system um, in the trademark office and uh, have a, a proper certificate of that issued by the Chinese administrative body. Um, and now um, answering your question, um, first of all, um, if the trademark is only used, if if a Chinese company only uses um, its mark and it was not registered before, um, we can um, bring a court case against them um, to the civil court um, on the grounds of the um, of the unfair competition, um, of course, um, and. Uh, when the when the Chinese companies decide to register its um, trademark, uh, before the trademark is registered, we can try to invalidate the registration. We can uh, file an opposition to the trademark office, and then we have to provide uh, evidence that we registered our trademark before theirs, before they filed their application, um, and that that we are using the trademark on the Chinese market. Um, if the if the trademark of the Chinese companies was already has been already registered, um, then of course we have to see whether 
our trademark um, was registered later um, than, the, than the Chinese company's one. If that is so, then we have to uh, refer to the well-known trademark sy uh, protection system. That's the um, the um, the best way to to win <laughs> that case. And if uh, the um, the trademark of the Chinese companies was registered later, um, then we can uh, sue the company for the infringement of our trademark on the basis of creating confusion if the um, products or um, services are similar or identical. Okay. So. Okay. Um, we don't really have any questions on the chat. So I guess you explained everything anyone would, would expect. Uh, we can wait one more minute for any questions. Okay. Um, but I could also ask you, I, I was thinking during her presentation about the, the protected designation of origin uh, system in the, in the EU, which mostly concerns uh, fighting the counterfeits regarding food and um, and dietary supplements and stuff like that mostly food um, do you do, is, is there anything is there any system like that in China as well regarding uh, the protection the protected designation of organ or protected designation of name uh, regarding regarding uh, food? Um, yes, yes, of course, there is a system of protection for ge uh, geographical indications as well in China. Um, however, um, it's, um, it is um, only restricted to the Chinese companies. Yes, so, the, for example, Mao Tai can, uh, can be considered um, as a ge geographical um, indication and can be protected in that way. Um, however, um, recently, there was an agreement signed between uh, the European Union and uh, the People's Republic of China that, uh, that grants protection for 100 uh, European geographical indications uh, on the Chinese market. So now, um, if we produce such products as Polish vodka, uh, then we can uh, seek protection in Chinese court if a Chinese company would start to uh, produce a good um, with, with a mark uh, with, with marked as a Polish vodka. Yes. And on the other on the other hand, uh, if in the European Union uh, somebody would start to uh, produce uh, Mao Tai, something like Mao Tai, uh, Baijiu, and then uh, name it Mao Tai. Uh, then the um, original producer of of this Baijiu um, can be can sue um, the European company between the European court. However, that would be a very original move, business uh, business yes. initiative to produce Baijiu in, in Europe, definitely. Yes, uh, yes. However, I guess the, the Baijiu is getting recognition also uh, among the, uh, not only among Chinese, but also uh, Westerners, because there was recently a rap song about, about Baijiu, uh, and there were also um, Europeans and Americans involved <laughs> in that song. You know, whatever works for you, yeah. uh, I guess. All right. If we don't have any questions, I'd like to I'd like to thank you, Michal, for for uh, giving us this lecture uh, this evening. I think we all learned a lot, okay. and uh, I'd like to inform you all and invite you all uh, to the next Polish Asian gathering that will take place uh, next week. And all the details will be uh, posted uh, in our social media. So stay tuned and and have a good night. Have a good, good, good evening, you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending.